Ourvacareer.com presents Akbar by Lawrence Pinion. Chapter 1. Contemplating the favorites of fame whose laurel is bestowed, like fortune's smile, not always according to desert, mankind is willingly credulous. Magnified by time and distance, these far-seen personages gather round them an air of fable. Sometimes, conscious of their power to hallucinate, they have conspired with the world's credulity to create their own legend. In vain are the efforts of the rational, when once a man possesses the imagination of the world. All the exposed light lenaces and falsifications of a Napoleon fail to prevent him from towering over his time. But in Akbar, one of the world's great conquerors, and a greater ruler, there is something which spontaneously rejects the legendary. It is true that his historians have dutifully made some little attempts to surround him with a superhuman glory. The usual portents are said to have occurred, at seven months the baby made an eloquent speech from the cradle. But the fictitious aureole fails to cling. It is as if the man himself shook off such fetters with impatience. Not that he had no appetite for glory, far from it. But the reality, he would have felt, sufficed. Akbar was the grandson of that joyous and superb adventurer Bobur, who, inheriting the throne of a small, though delectable, country in the middle of Asia, spent his life in fighting and scheming for a grander throne, he ended by swooping down on Hindustan and conquering there a great dominion. His son Humayun held this precariously till he was driven out by rival rulers of Afghan race. After years of exile he won back his throne, only to die. Humayun's son, Akbar, then but a boy, had to fight for his inheritance. He secured it, and then, piece by piece, kingdom by kingdom, he annexed in an almost incessant series of wars the countries surrounding his frontiers, till his empire stretched from sea to sea. Except for that southern portion of India called Deccan, he became master of India. Such was his achievements as conqueror. His greater achievement as a ruler was to weld this collection of different states, different races, different religions, into a whole. It was accomplished by elaborate organization Akbar had an extraordinary genius for details still more by the settled policy which persuaded his subjects of the justice of their ruler. Akbar's conceptions were something new in the history of Asiatic conquerors. Though a foreigner, he identified himself with the India he had conquered. And much of his system was to be permanent. The principles and practice worked out by Akbar and his ministers were largely adopted into the English system of government. Yet Akbar's achievements are transcended in interest by the man himself. And in a little book like the present it is the portrait of the man rather than the story of his doings with which we shall be the most concerned. The full record of his conquests and administration can be read in the pages of Mr. Vincent Smith's Essek Bar, The Great Mogul, a volume which has its faults and which is sometimes curiously unjust to its hero, but in which is collected a vast amount of solid information. The chief original authority is the Akbar Nama. The story of Akbar, written in Persian by the Emperor's friend and minister, Abul Fat Sal. They are other Indian histories. But of greater interest to us, perhaps, are the vivid accounts given by the Jesuits who stayed at Akbar's court and sometimes accompanied him on his expeditions. Hardly anyone so conspicuously eminent in history is so plainly set before our eyes or has so actual a presence in our imagination. The detailed records of his daily life, no less than of his achievements, are corroborated not only by numerous portraits but by a long series of small paintings, very many of which are now in this country, in which his manifold activities are vividly depicted. We have him before our eyes in his prime of life. He is compact of frame, muscular, rather burly, of moderate stature, but broad-shouldered neither lean nor stout of a healthy complexion, the color of ripe wheat. His eyes, rather small, but with long lashes, sparkle like the points of light on little waves when they catch the sun. He wears mustaches, but no beard. His voice is loud and full. When he laughs, it is with his whole face. His movements are quick, though from much riding in his youth he is slightly bow-legged. 
He carries his head a little on one side over the right shoulder. His nose is no commanding beak, it is straight and small, the nostrils wide and mobile. Below the left nostril is a wart, thought to be very agreeable in appearance. In whatever assemblage of men, he is recognizably the king. He radiates energy. His temper is naturally violent, and he is aware of it, so much so, that his orders are that no death warrant is to be carried out till it is twice confirmed. His anger is terrible, but easily appeased. He has an insatiable curiosity, and loves new things. His mind is as incessantly employed as his body. And yet strange to say, Akbar, the greatest armed, except possibly Philip of Spain, the wealthiest potentate of his time in the world, a man versed in history and poetry and delighting in philosophical discussion, is illiterate. He can neither read nor write. It is true that there exists on the flyleaf of a precious manuscript copy of the life of Tima, Akbar's ancestor, a single signature of his, laboriously written in a childish hand and reverently attested by his son Jaanji. But the signature, preserved as an unique marvel, only confirms the universal testimony to his inability. Yet, if unable to read, he is all the more able to remember. He has books read aloud to him, and knows them better than it he had read them himself. His memory indeed is as prodigious as his energy. A traveller from Europe in the latter part of the 16th century who should arrive at last in the mogul dominion would find no difficulty in seeing the emperor at close quarters and enjoying his conversation. Foreigners were welcome, and indeed among those who habitually thronged the courtyards at Fateh, poor Sikri, that strange splendid city built at Akbar's whim and afterwards so suddenly abandoned, were men of various Asiatic races, predominantly Persians, Turks, and Hindus, and of many diverse creeds. The Great Mughal was a sort of fairy tale in the West, yet here were all the marks of a civilization closely parallel with that of Europe, though so different on the surface. The external magnificence might have some touches of the barbaric, but then what barbarities mingled with the refinements of European courts? What dirt was disguised by the perfumes? Refinements were here of every sort, not only luxurious appointments and the gratification of the senses, but a love of letters and the arts. Poetry was held in high honor, and the ingenuity of the Persian pet's conceits could rival those of Marani and his northern imitators. Painters and architects abounded under the direct patronage of the emperor, who himself had learnt to draw and was a skilled musician, besides being a worker in half a dozen handicrafts. If theological disputation and religious animosities were a sign of high civilization, these rivaled in fierceness those of western countries, but while in Europe the disputants burnt or massacred one another in their zeal and devastated whole countries in the name of religion, here in India a restraining power prevented arguments from ending in the use of swords, here was a monarch who actually believed in toleration. Any day, then, our traveller might have seen Akbar holding a reception, for he holds audience twice a day. The blaze of the Indian sun makes strong shadows from the veranda pillars of the Red Sandstone Palace, where Akbar receives one courtier or envoy after another. Peacocks sun themselves on the roof of the veranda, in the country yard elephants are slowly led, a groom holds a cheetah in leash, an animated crowd of virile looking men in dresses of fine silk and of various colours stand about. Akbar himself is dressed in a sako reaching to the knees, where he a stricter Muslim it would reach to the feet, and wears a closely rolled turban hiding his hair, a rope of great pearls hangs from his neck. His man has subtle changes. With the great he is great and does not unbend, to the humble he is kindly and sympathetic. It is noticeable how he makes more of the small presence of the poor, and he is very fond of presents, than of the costly gifts of the nobles, at which he will hardly glance. As a dispenser of justice he is famous, everyone wronged, an observer has said, believes the emperor is on his side. Four times in twenty-four hours Akbar prays to God, at sunrise, at noon, at sunset, and midnight. But anyone who tried to keep up with his daily activities would need to be of iron make. 
three hours suffice for Akbar's sleep. He eats but one meal a day, and that at no fixed time. He eats but little meat, less and less as he grows older, why should we make ourselves a sepulchre for beets? Is one of his sayings. Rice and sweet meats are the chief of his diet, and fruit, of which he is extremely fond. His day is long one, and he fills it full. Between state councils and conferences with ministers or generals he inspects his elephants of which he has five thousand in his stables his horses, and other animals. He knows them by name. He notes their condition, if any show signs of growing thin and poorly, the keeper responsible finds his salary docked. Presently he will repair to an upper terrace where are the dovecotes, built of blue and white brick, and with infinite pleasure he watches the evolutions of the tumbler pigeons, deploying and returning, massing or separating, to the sound of a whistle. Part of the day is devoted to the harem, in which there are three hundred women. At another time he will be watching, like Marcus or Elias, gladiatorial combats, or fights between elephants, or between elephants and lions. But though entering with such zest on his amusements, his mind is occupied also with other things, for messengers arrive continually from every part of the empire and rapid decisions have to be taken. Another time he is inspecting his school of painters, passing quickly among them and appraising their work. Or he will go down to the workshop, and turn carpenter or stone mason. He is especially fond of the foundry, and loves to found a cannon with his own hands. When at evening lights are lit in the great hall, the emperor takes his seat among his counters and his books read to him, or music is played, and Akbar himself joins in or he laughs at jests and stories. If there are foreigners present, he plies them with unceasing questions. He will sit far into the night absorbed in discussions on religion, this is one of his dear delights. He drinks wine, or wine mixed with opium, and sometimes falls into a stupor, but this does not affect his terrible energy. Yet this crowded, pulsing life he does not wholly absorb him. Frequently he will disappear and sit apart in solitary meditation for hours at a time. Such is Akbar's way of life at court. But these are only intervals between campaigns, which he always opens with a hunt on an enormous scale. Even on his campaigns he will, when there is no need for swift marching, pursue much the same occupations. Of how many notable people in the world's history does our knowledge seem so complete? Yet do we really, after all, know Akbar the man? What is the truth about his character? Quite contrary opinions have been expressed, and many of his actions can be interpreted in opposite ways. Since the witness of Akbar's own historian, Abu Fatsal, may be thought too prejudiced he is indeed fulsome in flattery, though he records with equanimity acts which, to us at any rate, are not very creditable let us turn to the Jesuits, they certainly had no motive for giving Akbar more than his due. He never, says Bartoli, gave anybody the chance to understand rightly his inmost sentiments or to know what faith or religion he held by, but in whatever way he could best serve his own interests he used to feed one party or the other with the hope of gaining him to itself, humoring each side with fair words. A man apparently free from guile, as honest and candid as could be imagined, but in reality so close and self-contained, with twists of words and deeds so divergent from each other and most times so contradictory, that even by much seeking one could not find the clue to his thoughts. That is one view, the portrait of a consummate dissembler, open in appearance, inwardly subtle and deceitful and bent only on his own aggrandizement. And if this clue be accepted, it is easy to read Akbar's actions in that light. When he is humane to an enemy or traitor and his humanity seemed extraordinary to his contemporaries he can be represented as humane only from policy. And his wars of aggression, which some have represented to have been undertaken from the noblest motives only, have been pictured by others as merely the behavior of a pike in pond, preying on its weaker neighbors. In fact, the truth about Akbar is not simple, his was by nature a complex character, in the intricacy of circumstances its complexity was bound to be increased. 
but let us try to approach it a little closer. The Jesuits came into contact with Akbar through discussions on religion. He had sent for them of his own accord and they had hoped to convert him. But they had every excuse for being exasperated with him since he always in the end eluded their grasp and nothing is more natural than Bartoli's angry outburst. But when the question of religion is an abeyance, when the ground is neutral and there is no occasion for prejudice, we find a different tone. The king is by nature simple and straightforward. These are the words of the Jesuit Manzirate, who accompanied Akbar on his Kabul expedition, and the occasion was the discovery of Akbar of treachery on the part of a man he had loaded with honors. Naturally humane, gentle and kind is the phrase of Pirasci. Just to all men, says another. By nature simple and straightforward, that, I think, is the truth but we must stress a little that by nature. For, that a man should live the life led by Akbar, accomplish what he accomplished, and succeed in being always simple and straightforward, would be something of a miracle. In continual danger from his boyhood, he was surrounded by treachery, jealousy, and intrigue. He seldom knew whom he could trust. He had continually to wear a mask and to hide his thoughts in self-confidence. The astonishing thing is that he did not end in protecting himself by an armor of permanent suspicion and guile, but that he would often trust men after they had proved unfaithful, still seeking to find if any portion of good remains in that evil nature, as he said on one occasion. But was he to be trusted himself? Not perhaps when ambition possessed him, or a great scheme was at stake. We shall find. When we come to recount them, certain events in which he cannot be acquitted of unscrupulous and even perfidious behavior. And yet fundamentally, I am persuaded, he was honest and sincere. See how, when he meets a transparently honest nature, like Rydolfo Akwiva, the mutual liking is instinctive. Naturally humane and kind. Everyone was struck by this aspect of Akbar's character, remarkable indeed in one who had the absolute powers of an autocrat and who suffered so much from faithless servants. Yet he could be fiercely cruel in his anger. Historians are accustomed to condone the faults of a great man by arguing that they were the faults of his time. But a man shows his greatness by the measure in which he surpasses the standards of his age. Akbar's acts of cruelty less cold-blooded than the cruelties of contemporary rulers in Europe and even 20th century Europe cannot afford to give itself superior airs in this respect these acts shock us because they were done by Akbar, who could be so singularly generous and forgiving. Akbar said, the noblest quality of princes is the forgiveness of faults. And his kindness and humanity are the more surprising in one who had in his veins the blood of the two most pitiless conquerors the world has known, Jingai's Khan and Tamerlin. Vincent Smith maintains that Akbar's clemency in his earlier years was merely policy, that if he had been strong enough he would have punished and not spared. Who shall say? Motives mingle. But if he perceived that the humane course was not only generous but sensible, I think we should rather admire his intelligence than blame his astuteness. At any rate Akbar's clemency, like Caesar's, was famous. Was he also, like Caesar, an epileptic? The native historians say nothing of it, nor does Manzirate, the Jesuit, who knew him intimately. The statement that he had the falling sickness is casually made in Dujaric's compilation from Jesuit notes and records, on what authority is unknown, and only there. The Jesuits supposed that he took to sports and amusements to distract his melancholy, which seems a superfluous conjecture. But the fact of the disease is not improbable. Akbar's second son Murad developed epilepsy. Just to all men. It was Akbar's justice that chiefly reconciled the peoples he conquered to his rule it was a basic quality in his nature. And it proceeded not so much, I think, from a sense of law, as from a sort of uncorrupted innocence of mind which persisted through all his experience of the world. Innocence may seem a strange word to use. I mean an innate candor powerful enough to be able to see things unclouded by the prejudices which we absorb from our surroundings or inherit from the past or imbibe from early teaching, 
and to which most natures unconsciously surrender. There were impositions which for centuries the Mohammedan conquerors had laid upon the Hindus. They had been accepted as things of course. They were the conquerors due. To Akbar with his direct vision they seemed unjust and though hardly more than a boy, against all tradition, against the opposition of every one, he abolished them. It was again in the teeth of the most dangerous opposition that he made overtures to the Jesuits and seemed on the verge of adopting Christianity. What held him back in the end? It was the thought to which, with the child's obstinacy, he was always returning, there are good men professing every creed, and each proclaiming his creed to be true, all the others false, how can one be sure that he is right? He was the antithesis of a bigot. On the other hand, he was anything but indifferent. For in this man of action, this lover of life, whose body exulted in its strength and who strode through the world so confidently, there was hidden a profound capacity for sadness, self-doubting thoughts, dissatisfactions, a craving for illumination. From boyhood he had, from time to time, mystical experiences in which he seemed to be given direct communion with the Divine Presence, and on his deathbed, when he was past recognizing men and past all speech, while eager theologians hung over him in the hope to direct the departing soul, he was heard murmuring to himself and endeavoring to articulate the name of God. So it was that the Jesuit fathers, intent to win all of him or nothing, supposed him to be tortuously evading them for some subtle policy of his own, whereas it was really his own baffled simplicity of reasoning, never able to surrender itself to authority from without, which in its turn baffled them. There is something engaging in Akbar's faults and weaknesses, which were not petty, but rather belonged to the things which made him great. He was, above all things, human. Chapter 2 What was Akbar's inheritance? What was the background of his mind? We have for a moment to forget the European heritage which is in our blood and to which we are so accustomed that we take it for granted, the art, the literature, the philosophy, of Greece, the imperial memory of Rome, Roman law and Roman roads, or the complex tissue of the medieval legacy. In place of them is the Mohammedan culture, not wholly separated from ours, since Islam derives so much from Judaism and Christianity and, through Arab writers, from Greece, but in art and letters looking always to the classics of Iran, Persian architecture, Persian poetry, Persian paintings, behind which, little known in actuality, but having, like Gris in Europe, a vast prestige, is the art of China. This is what Akbar brings with him into India. That Akbar had Turkish, Mongol, and Persian blood in his veins. On his father's side he was seventh in descent from Timur, Tamerlin. Through the mother of Babur he was descended from Jingai's Khan. The tremendous figures of these two world conquerors dominated the historic scene of Asia. To us their conquests, wider than those of any conquerors before or since, seem almost meaningless, the tale of their fury, the obliterated cities, the smoke and flame, the shrieks and slaughter, is like the phantasmagoria of a frightful dream, followed by the absolute silence of the dead. Viewed from a like distance, would not the transient conquests of Napoleon, his sheet worry of Europe at his Robert Bridges apt and scornful phrase appear much the same? But Jingai's and Timur, for all their insane lust of destruction, were no saves, Timur, when he destroyed a city, always spared its artists, they were men of prodigious ability, their armies were controlled by iron discipline, their strategy and way of war continued to be Akbar's models he could never wholly discard to military tradition, and retained some of its ferocious observances. And yet his conquests were different in kind. Having won Hindustan, he was resolved to become Indian, to belong wholly to that India which drew him on as if by some secret and unconscious affinity. I do not suppose that Akbar had ever heard of Aska, the greatest ruler of India in the past. Had he known of his aims and achievements, as they are now known through the labors of European scholars, we can conceive with what extreme interest he would have studied Aska's career and his methods of administration. For Aska's empire was even vaster than Akbar's, it embraced almost the whole of India, 
Nepal, and Kashmir. Asko was the grandson of Chandragupta, the Maurya king who had foiled the attempt of Seleucus, the satrap of Babylon, to renew and extend Alexander's temporary hold on Indian territory, and who had established a firm rule over northern India. It was thus a settled empire to which Asko succeeded, he had not to fight for security. There were, however, outlying parts to be brought into the empire and in the thirteenth year from his accession, probably the year 261 BC, Asko conquered and annexed the kingdom of Klinga, on the coast of the Bay of Bengal. This conquest was the turning point of his whole life. Caesar, came, saw and conquered. Asker conquered, and then saw. He saw what war and conquest meant. He saw that through him a hundred thousand of his fellow beings had been killed, fifty thousand more had been taken into captivity, and myriads more had died or suffered violence. He was filled with remorse and sorrow. Thenceforth he began his new life. He resolved to be a conqueror, but the conquest was to be not of arms but of the sacred law. This was a conquest full of joy, and the emperor desired for all animated beings security, self-control, peace of mind, and joyousness. Asuka had adopted the way of Buddha. Immediately after the Klinga campaign, he became a lay disciple, and not long afterwards he became a Buddhist monk. The conversion of Asuka was a momentous event in the history of mankind. Buddhism, till then a somewhat obscure sect, was set on its way to become a world religion. Asko reigned for about forty years, and never relaxed his missionary ardor. His edicts enjoining the duties of the law on all his people were engraved on rocks far and wide through his dominions and on stone pillars wherever suitable stone existed. Nor was he content with preaching the Buddhist gospel to his own subjects, he sent missionaries to Syria, to Egypt, to Africa, Macedonia, Epirus. Though a monk, Asker led no life of sequestered contemplation. He was supremely active, and insisted on activity in others. Let small and great exert themselves, he proclaimed. The welfare of the whole people was his incessant concern. Not only did he preach the duties of filial piety, of truth-telling, compassion, alms-giving, the sanctity of all life, and toleration for the genuine beliefs of others, but the practical details of administration occupied his thoughts. By the hot and dusty roads shady trees bearing fruit were to be planted for the comfort of both men and animals, wells were to be dug, rest houses built, watering places contrived, medicinal herbs were to be grown, and hospitals founded for the sick. Here was a ruler, unique among the great rulers of Manking, who would assuredly have engaged Akbar's sympathy and admiration, though doubtless he would have found it hard to contemplate the renunciation of war. Most of all would he have been attracted by Asuka's precept of toleration. Not because it was a politic toleration, like the Roman toleration, springing from indifference, but because, like Akbar's own attitude of mind, it sprang from respect for sincere faith, of whatever professed denomination. It is true that he had no such thorny problems to deal with as confronted the great Mughal. The various faiths of India had such in common, there were no such militant claims as those of Islam and Christianity. Moreover, it was in a sense easy for him to renounce war just because his empire was the inheritance of successful war. Standing in the full daylight of history, Akbar appears to us between two shadowy yet strangely contrasted worlds, between the world of his Central Asian ancestors, a world of torrential human energy, idolizing that energy for its own sake, and possessed with the fever of the hunt, whether of beasts or of men for Akbar's gigantic hunts are like an echo of Tamerlan's campaigns of slaughter between that world of furious action, passing like a dream, and the world of India, which could revel indeed in luxuries and cruelties, but which could also produce the exalted spirits of Buddha and Asuka, speaking to us from a far remoter past than those wild conquerors, but with voices that still live and move us. Akbar, too, is possessed with insatiable energy, he seems action incarnate, and yet at the core of his nature is something alien to all that something that craves for thought and contemplation, 
that seeks justice and desires gentleness. Chapter 3. But what of his more immediate ancestry? Once, returning from a campaign, Akbar questioned Manzirat about Sebastian, king of Portugal, who had fallen fighting against the Moors in 1578. When he had heard the story, he burst out, I can never sufficiently praise the heroism of those who fight hand to hand and in deadly earnest. But I shall never cease to condemn the cowardice of those who prefer the safety of their bodies to the eternal glory of war. The joy of danger, the eternal glory of war. It might be the voice of Babur. From the June day when his father short, stout, careless, hasty visiting his pigeons in a pigeon house on the top of a precipice was suddenly hurled to the bottom pigeons and all, by a landslip and transferred to another world, but, but then a boy of eleven, had to fight for his crown or his life or his ambition and he loved it. The moment that he heard that his father was dead he sprang on horseback. Three invasions menaced his capital. He had to meet and quell them all. Three years later, he sees this Amarkand, the city of his forefather Timur, the city of his dreams. After a hundred days of possession, he lost it. Twice later he was to hold it for a brief time, then he lost it forever. His Uzbek enemies were too strong for him. And he had lost his little kingdom of Ferrana too. His great ambition had been to sit on Timur's throne in Samarkand. He renounced that cherished dream but a throne he was determined to have, while he tramped the hills an exile among the shepherds. He had undying confidence in his star. His thoughts turned southward. Kabul was in a state of anarchy, following the death of its king, who was Babur's uncle. He decided to march on Kabul. He took it and became king. At Kabul he was on the road to India, and according to his own account, the thought of subduing Hindustan was already in his mind as soon as he had become master of Kabul. Long before, a very old woman had told him tales of Timur's invasion of India, and he had never forgotten. If he could not have Timur's thrown in Samarkand, he might follow in his ancestor's footsteps southward. But it was twenty-two years after the conquest of Kabul before he entered Delhi and triumph and founded the empire that Akbar was to rule. In temperament and in certain outstanding traits of character Akbar resembled his grandfather. But we shall note the differences. But, but in his perfectly frank and delightful memoirs, one of the most remarkable books of its kind ever written, gives us a vivid self-portrait. He has the Mongol restlessness in his blood, but he is much more a Turk and has no words strong enough for his hatred and contempt of the Mongols he knew. With enormous energy and absolutely fearless courage, he is rapid in his decisions, often succeeding by his swift action but often betrayed into disaster by his reckless confidence. But he could profit by experience. He trained his army to a high pitch of efficiency, he became a master of the art of war. Severe in discipline, he could at times be savagely cruel, the Mongol strain perhaps coming out, yet in general he was chivalrous, loyal, generous, and forgiving. He hated falseness above all. Babur might appear to be nothing more than a splendid adventurer of exceptional ability, but that he seems, all through the amazing vicissitudes of his career, to have nourished the dream of founding an empire and to have succeeded not by the mere luck of a soldier of fortune but by a singular pertinacity and belief in his destiny. And even as an adventurer he is remarkable. This hardy soldier, this marvelous fighter, who swims every river he comes across, astonishes us by his singular sensibility. A man could win his heart by his love of poetry as surely as by his swordsmanship. Was he flying from his enemies in bitter weather with a handful of followers? He would compose a few couplets as he rode, and his spirits revived as by magic. But it was his intense delight in the beauty of the world which made so large a part of his unquenchable zest in life. Was ever such a lover of flowers? His first thought in a newly acquired territory was to make a garden, himself superintending the disposition of the beds and the letting of fresh runnels of water among them. In the year before his death in 1530, amid the heat and dust of India, he writes, The other day they brought me a musk melon, 
As I cut it up I felt a deep homesickness and sense of exile from my native land, and I could not help weeping. For Babur never felt at home in the plains of India. He pined for his native hills, for Ferrana, that delectable province set among the mountains in the midst of Asia, with its cool air, its leaping brooks, its fertile fields, its grapes and melons and pomegranates. Ferrana was a favored land, was it not the marvelous horses of Ferrana which were coveted from afar by the emperors of China? Kabul, with its mountain climate, though less adorable than Ferrana, was congenial to Babur's nature. India he found ugly and unattractive. It is true he meant to stay there, not merely to invade and plunder as other raiders from the north had done before him, but he meant to rule as a foreign conqueror over the Indians. His policy did not go beyond the policy of Timur, it was that of giving his lieutenants the government of apportioned districts, and an empire founded on these lines was bound to dissolve among the quarrels and ambitions of these deputy rulers, as the vast empire of Timur had dissolved so swiftly, that it did not crumble away, that it endured till the 19th century, is due solely to Akbar's larger policy and constructive foresight. It is the measure of Akbar's greatness. To a temperament akin to that of his grandfather, there was added in Akbar a more masculine intellect. The Burr's poetry and sensibility to beauty become in him a voracious curiosity and an ardent interest in religious problems. Where Babur was romantic, Akbar was a realist. The story of Babur's death is a fit close to his romantic career. His son Humayun was dangerously ill and his life was despaired of. Babur vowed he would give his life for his son S. He prayed earnestly, pacing around his son S. sick bed, that his vow might be accepted, and it was so. Humayun recovered, Babur died. Humayun recovered, to find himself emperor. But though Hindustan had been conquered, it needed a strong hand to hold it, and Humayun had not the strength required. He was now a young man of twenty-two. With his narrow shoulders, slight stoop, long face and pointed beard, he had an aspect of fragility. He was addicted to opium. Thought not a weakling, there was a childish side to his character. He was naturally inclined to be more interested in the different colors of his dresses than in statecraft and command. But he was forced into action. He was obliged to make over the government of the Punjab and Afghanistan to his brother Kamran. Even the throne of Bihar, Shisha, a very able ruler, saw his opportunity and attacked. Humayun, was disaster fibrously defeated, and fled with a few followers into the deserts of Sindh. Chapter 4 One morning, late in November 1542, Humayun, encamped on the shores of a small lake with a force of some two thousand horsemen lent him by a friendly chief, saw the dust of a group of riders approaching at speed over the desert. The homeless emperor had need to be wary. For two years, driven from his kingdom by the victories of Shasha, he had been wandering in the sandy wilderness of Sindh, to the west of India, with a handful of followers. He could settle on no plan. He knew not whom he could trust. His own brothers, Kamran and Askari, were his rivals, doubtful friends, probable enemies. Swift riders were only too likely to be bearers of bad news. But on this day Humayun could hope. The riders came from the direction of Amarkout, a little fortified town some twenty miles distant from his camp, and at Amarkout he had left his young wife expecting shortly to be a mother. The messenger rode into the camp with joyful signs. Hamida had been delivered of a boy. Humayun had an heir. Here at last was something of good augury, and Humayun rejoiced in the thought of his beloved girl wife. She was only fifteen when she gave birth to her firstborn. She had not been over willing to marry a fugitive king without a crown, but she had charmed his heart, he had wooed her with ardor, and now she had given him an heir and hope. Such an occasion should have been celebrated with pomp and ceremony and the giving of many presents. What was the proud father to do in his poverty? His servant Johar, who was there, has recorded the scene how Johar was ordered to bring a bag of silver coins and a silver bracelet and a pod of mist.
and how Humayun ordered the silver to be given back to the owners from whom it had been taken, a convenient mode of largesse, and taking the pod of musk broke it on a porcelain dish and distributed it among the chief of his followers, and said, This is all the present I can afford to make you on the birth of my son, whose fame will, I trust, be one day expanded over all the world, as the perfume of the musk now fills this tent. The child was given the name of Akbar. He was born on the 23rd day of November 1542. But Humayun could not at once have the joy of embracing wife and son. He was on the march, and did not rest till he had taken possession of the town of June and made his encampment secure against surprise. At last, on 28 December, Hamida and her baby arrived, and Humayun for the first time set eyes on his son. Till July of the following year he stayed at June, planning what he should do next. The birth of his son strengthened, no doubt, the resolution, which he had never given up, to recover by some means of other his lost kingdom. For though he had many weaknesses, and was no master of war like his father, he had a certain tenacity of purpose even in circumstances the most desperate. He could not forever roam the deserts of Sindh. Should he try for Kandahar? Once there, he might get help from the Persian Shah. It was on Kandahar that he decided to march. But there were his two brothers, Kamran and Askari, to be reckoned with. Kamran was ruler of Kabul, and Askari, the younger brother, held the province of Kandahar under Kamran. The latitude was doubtful, but the hazard must be run. Humayun had a long and difficult march before him. He had to cross the Indus and then find a way over the mountain barriers of Balakistan. Arrived at the frontier of Kandahar province, Humayun received sudden and dismaying news. Askari, his brother, was in motion to attack him with a force far outnumbering his own. There was nothing for it but to flee, and not a moment to be lost. There was a hurried consultation. The child Akbar had been brought so far in his mother's arms, but in the mountains of Afghanistan the extremes of heat and cold would be fatal to a one-year-old baby, now that they must travel on horseback and at forced speed. The child was left behind in the care of Johar. They were even short of horses, and Hamida must ride on Humayun's horse with him. The fugitives dashed away to the mountains, and were hardly gone when Askari swooped down in the camp and captured his infant nephew. If Askari was tempted to forestall fortune and, after a favorite practice of ambitious members of Asian royal houses, to make sure by getting rid of a future rival, he resisted the temptation, or it may be that he was taken by the sturdy child. He carried it off to Kandahar, the faithful Johar in attendance, and there it was treated well. Meanwhile, Humayun and his girl wife and forty men continued their desperate course. Humayun had now resolved to flee to Persia and seek assistance from the Shah. Having received friendly messages in answer to his overtures, he made the long journey over Persia to Kazvin, where Shah Tarmasp then held his court in the far northwest. Shah Tarmasp received Humayun cordially. But he soon tired of playing host to a fugitive who gave no signs of going. For about a year Humayun lingered at the Persian court. This sojourn in a luxurious and cultured center after years of precarious wanderings and hardships in desert plains and mountains, made a deep impression on the Mughal prince, just as Babur before him had been impressed with the brilliant culture of heart when Persian art was producing its finest masterpieces. He was naturally fond of books and learning and a lover of art, and at Kasvin he saw what he hoped one day to have round him at Delhi a gathering of poets, wits, scholars, and artists. What is called the Mughal school of Indian painting so ardently fostered by Akbar when he came to the throne, had its origin in Humayun's visit to Persia. Shah Tarmas, though not a very estimable monarch, was a great patron of the arts, and some of the most famous painters of Persia were working at Tabriz. Late in 1544, Humayun was dismissed with the promise of Persian troops to help him win back his patrimony. Before a year was over Kandahar had surrendered, and Askari was pardoned by his brother. Humayun advanced on Kabul. 
His other brother, Kamran, abandoned the city, and Humayun established himself in his place. The little Akbar was already at Kabul, his mother, left behind at Kandahar, was sent for, and the three were united once more. Not that their troubles were over, for Humayun's position was still insecure, and Kamran alternated in sincere submissions and reconciliations with open and ferocious hostility or secret intrigues. But Humayun during the nine years of his stay at Kabul had time to gather his forces for the long-cherished attempt to recover India, and to educate the son who was to inherit his recovered throne. To educate? But he was one thing to provide instructors, and another to persuade the pupil to learn. And never was a boy more refractory. Four tutors in turn did their utmost, the boy refused even to learn his letters. Humayun with his scholarly tastes, was annoyed, he reproved his much-loved son for his idleness, and gave him fond and fatherly advice. It was of little avail. Akbar was a cheerful and accomplished truant. From the very day of his birth he had been in the midst of danger, adventure, and desperate enterprise, he was enamored of outdoor life, and threw his whole heart into masculine sports and exercises. He liked being with animals horses, dogs and camels and became expert in pigeon flying, a sport of which he remained excessively fond. In riding, polo and sword play he was highly trained as well as efficient by nature. He became an excellent shot. And his reluctance to learn to read was not combined with the diversion from things of the mind so often found in the English schoolboy devoted to games. On the contrary, he delighted in being read to by others, and, with his amazing memory, soon had by heart whole poems of the Persian poets, especially those of the Sufi mystics. Humayun would also have his son taught something of the art of painting. In 1550 he invited to Kabul two young Persian artists of great distinction, Mir Syed Ali and Abu Samaid, and these two became his principal court painters and afterwards went to Delhi. Both Humayun and the boy Akbar took lessons in the Persian style of drawing. In the Gilistan Library at Tehran there is a miniature by Abu Samaid, in which we see the little prince among his craftsmen, and in another part of the picture he presents a drawing commemorating the scene to the emperor. At this time, too, Humayun, his throne and by his pride of ancestry, had himself painted with the Timurid princes, and Timur himself around him. The Persian artist produced a dazzling picture. The setting was among the hills in spring, with pomegranates in flower by an iris-bordered stream, and a rustling plane tree overhead against the golden sky. Slim red pillars supported the pavilion in which sat Humayun facing his terrible ancestor Timur, and in a semicircle below sat the descendants of Timur who were Humayun's ancestors. At a later date the figure of Timur was effaced, and portraits of Akbar, with his son and grandson substituted by an Indian painter. The picture is now in the British Museum. So in peaceful pursuits, variegated by frequent alarms and excursions, these years at Kabul passed, until the favorable moment came when the long-planned descent on India might be carried with good hope of success. In November 1554, Humayun started. Akbar was now twelve years old. After crossing the Indus father and son had a solemn audience together, and the blessing of heaven was invoked on their enterprise. There was a new ruler on the throne of Delhi, a far weaker man than his predecessor Salim Shah Shah, who had died this year. Hindustan too was in a disunited and chaotic state, disaffected to the Afghan rulers. The time therefore was propitious. An Humayun, no great captain himself, relied on a young man, Bairam Khan, an able soldier of high character, who was put in command of the army. The campaign was successful. Early in 1555 Humayun occupied Lahore, and in June a great victory, with which the young Akbar was officially credited, gained him Delhi. The lost throne was at last recovered. But not for long was it to be enjoyed. Akbar was sent in charge of Bairam Khan, now appointed his guardian to the Punjab, while Humayun remained in the capital. Much was to be done if the Mughals were to make their hold secure. 
Humayun planned to garrison the chief cities with his troops and was busy with the task of organization when, on a Friday evening in January 1556, as the sunset call to prayers was heard, he tripped and fell down the steep steps leading from the roof of a tower, used as a library, and broke his skull one. Three days later he was dead. Akbar received the news of his father's death of Kalinor, and in a garden at that place was formally enthroned, on a throne which still exists. Chapter 5 so, like his grandfather before him, Akbar gained a crown while still a boy, but a crown for which he had to fight. There were rival claimants. One was Sikandar Shah, a nephew of that able ruler Shishar, and it was against him that Bairam Khan and Akbar had been sent to the Punjab. But a more formidable opponent appeared in a certain Hindu named Hemu, who took the field for his master, Muhammad Shah Adil. Lately in occupation of Delhi, where he had usurped the throne but had soon been driven out. Hemu was a capable general. He defeated the Mughal forces and took Delhi and Agra, and puffed up by his victory, assumed sovereignty on his own account. It was a critical situation. But Hemu had to reckon with Bairam Khan, who would listen to no counsels of retreat to Kabul, and advancing with Akbar met the enemy's vastly superior army with its huge array of elephants, on the field of Panipat, where Babur had won the throne of Delhi. An arrow pierced Hemu through the eye, and his troops scattered in dismay. Hemu was captured, and Bairam Khan bade Akbar dispatch the wretched prisoner, but the boy shrank from using his sword on a wounded and helpless man. Delhi and Agra were retaken. Sikh and Ashur was pursued, and after a long resistance surrendered in 1557. He was generously treated. By that time the other claimants to the throne had died or disappeared from the scene. Akbar was free to rule, and to organize his realm. During these first years of his reign Akbar's education was continued. But while he delighted in the training of his body, and in all skillful exercises, he still refused to read and preferred to acquire knowledge of books by ear. At this time he appeared to those around him as a healthy, athletic boy, enjoying life to the full, passionately fond of hunting and games, and paying little attention to politics, finance, and the business of state. There is a portrait of him made about this time. Seen in profile, with smooth cheeks and lips and long curling hair, an animated expression in his eyes, and wearing a purple coat, he stands smelling a flower which he holds to his nostrils. Before him is blue sky and empty plain. Pose and presentment belong to current convention, but here seems specially happy in the portrait of eager youth with all the world before it. Yet, according to Abdul Fatsal, though he appeared indifferent to affairs, his mind was busy, he was shrewdly taking stock of his supporters and testing their loyalty in the atmosphere of intrigue and counter-intrigue which pervaded the court and perhaps an intimate observer might also have detected symptoms of something different and singular, of strange capacities for melancholy, beneath the outward glow of restless activity. Even at the age of fourteen Akbar could feel a sudden overwhelming dissatisfaction with the world. On a day in 1557 such a mood fell upon him. He felt the presence of short-sighted men, whose thoughts were all of this world, unendurable. He appeared to be full of anger and impatience, and sent for a certain horse of Erky breed, noted for its high mettle and vicious temper, a horse he often chose to ride. He would have none attend him, not even a groom, and mounting, he rode away into the desert plain he was then at Agra consumed with a passion to be away from men and utterly alone. Out of sight and in solitude, he dismounted and communed with God. The fiery horse at once galloped off and disappeared in the distance. Akbar remained alone on the plain, immersed in his ecstasy. But after a time, his heart refreshed and eased, he came to himself and looked around. He was in absolute solitude, and surrounded by silence. There was no one to attend him, no horse to carry him home. For a time he stood perplexed. Then suddenly he saw the horse hare run galloping out of the distance towards him. It came up and stood still beside him. The young king, astonished, 
mounted him, and rode back to his camp. It seemed to him a mysterious and divine intimation that he must return to his fellows and resume his work in the world. A strange experience for a boy of fourteen. But Akbar was already steeped in the mysticism of the Persian poets, whose verses he had learned by heart at Kabul. This mysticism appealed to his cast of mind, and, as we shall see, this adventure was the prelude to other experiences of a like nature. He was soon plunged in the delights of sport, this time with elephants. At Kabul he had dogs, horses, and camels, but now India gave him something new to master. An animal so huge and powerful, so swift in movement for all its bulk and weight, so intelligent, delighted Akbar. And if it was fierce, vicious and murderous, so much the more worthy to be tamed and made submissive to his will. When a certain elephant had killed its driver and savaged other men and had become a terror to all, Akbar as he was walking between the garden and the courtyard placed his foot on the elephant's tusk, smilingly took his seat, and set the great beast to fight with another quarrelsome elephant. In the middle of the fight, when he saw that the driver of the other elephant had lost control, he leapt from his own elephant to the other. This and other feats of skill, courage, and agility are recorded by Abu Fatsal, and the Emperor Yuanjir in his memoirs confirms his witness by later instances of his father's power to subdue the wildest and most unruly elephant to his will. Akbar's prowess caused astonishment and admiration, but also solicitude, and on one of these occasions Bairam Khan came to prostrate himself at the throne in gratitude to God for the preservation of his young sovereign's life. He distributed largesses also, to avert the evil eye. Bairam Khan belonged to the Shia sect, the orthodox sect in Persia, on this account he was disliked by the Sunnis, the dominant sect in India. But he raised more active enmity through his position as protector. There were others who coveted his power and wished to get the young emperor under their own influence. Moreover, he was still a young man, and might well be suspected of cherishing ambitions on his own account. Perhaps he was not altogether free from such ambitions. Those who were to be his most formidable enemies were the ladies of the court, who after the defeat of Hemu had been escorted from Kabul to India. The Queen Mother, Hamada, was then thirty years of age, and, now that after all the vicissitudes of her life success and empire were assured to her son, she was not unwilling to taste the new delights of power. With her came, among other ladies, Mahamanaga, chief of Akbar's nurses, who brought her son, Adam Khan. Mahamanaga was a woman of little scruple and great ambition. It was Bairam Khan who had won back the crown for Humayun. Without his skill and captaincy Akbar could hardly have retained it. Akbar was knowing great by nature, but, conscious of his own abilities, he chafed at the restrictions imposed on him, especially as he was kept short of money. During the next three years these feelings increased, and were assiduously encouraged by the ladies of the court, and by all those whom Bairam had offered it. A protector, apt to think himself indispensable, a strong man presuming on his strength, and a youthful emperor, also a strong nature and eager to enter on his full inheritance it was inevitable that a clash should come between them. The intrigues of the court went on, secret accusations against Bairam were continually being made. In 1560 matters came to a head. Akbar was now in his eighteenth year. Mahamanaga the chief nurse, took the lead in the conspiracy, and instigated Akbar to write a letter to Bairam Khan, announcing that he had determined to take the reins of government into his own hands and instructing Bairam to make the pilgrimage to Mecca, upon which you have been so long intent. Thus was Bairam disgraced. Worse than this, a disloyal servant of his own was chosen to follow him with an armed force and pack him off to Mecca. At this Bairam was stunned into rebellion. He was defeated and brought a prisoner to Akbar, who forgave him. He was given ample means to proceed to Mecca in such state as fitted his rank and eminence, and started off to the coast. But his pilgrimage was never fulfilled. At Patan he was attacked by a party of Afghans and stabbed to death. His four-year-old son, 
Abdurrahim, was brought to court and grew up under Akbar's protection to become the greatest of his nobles. We conducted from this feeling of remorse on Akbar's part for the shabby treatment accorded to his father, to whom Akbar owed so much. Bairam Khan was brave and loyal, his high ability unquestioned. He may have shown himself arrogant, but he had fallen a victim to the intrigues of smaller men and of jealous women. Mahamanagar enjoyed her triumph, Akbar for the time being seems to have been entirely under her influence. But before long she was to overreach herself through her ambitions for her son. Chapter 6 Meanwhile, the young emperor was called to active efforts in the field. The surrender of Gwalia and the annexation of Jaunpur had strengthened Akbar's frontiers, he was now determined to undertake the conquest of Malwa, a kingdom ruled over by a lover of wine and song and music, but Bahadur, and Mahamanagar's son, Adam Khan, was put in command of the expedition. But Bahadur's favorite wife, Rupmti, was famous for her charm and beauty. Their loves have been celebrated in song, and are the theme of many an Indian painting. We see them riding together among the hills by moonlight, or resting by the mountain streams. Before the battle which decided his fate, Basbahadur had given commands, according to Indian custom, that in the event of his defeat the lovely Rapamti should be killed with his other wives and concubines, so that they should not fall into his enemy's hands. He was defeated. Just as the victorious troops entered, Rapati was stabbed but still lived. Adam Khan sent to search for her, and tried to take her for his own, but she poisoned herself to escape him. Adam Khan also kept back the women and the spoils he had captured instead of sending them to court, and massacred the defeated population with a bloodthirsty delight. Akbar was enraged, and took swift measures. Leaving Agra in haste, he surprised the delinquent general, who behaved like a bewildered moth and humbly prostrated himself. His mother, Mahamanaga, hurried after Akbar to smooth matters over, and succeeded for the moment. She scolded her son and forced him to make reparation. But Adam Khan was incorrigible. He bribed his mother's servants to let him steal two special beauties from the harem of Basbahadur who had passed into Akbar's harem thinking that in the bustle of departure it would not be noticed. But he was found out, and the women were sent for by Akbar. Maham, afraid that if they came before the emperor her son's treachery would be disclosed, had them both put secretly to death. It speaks much for this woman's extraordinary plausibility and her ascendancy over Akbar that he condoned this cruel murder, though perhaps he never forgot it. On the way home a tigress with five cubs came out of the jungle in the path of the royal cavalcade. Akbar at once encountered it alone, and while his escort turned pale and sweated with apprehension, killed it with a single blow of his sword. At this time Akbar began a habit of disguising himself from time to time and mixing with his subjects in order to hear their opinion of things. On one such occasion, when there was great assemblage of pilgrims and others near Agra, he went among the crowd by night contemplating humanity, and was recognized by a vagabond. Instantly distorting his features and squinting with his eyes, he completely changed his appearance, the vagabond's surmise was discredited, and the emperor quietly stole away. These nocturnal adventures were in keeping with the Kbar's boundless curiosity. But it was something more than curiosity. Surrounded by flatterers and it rigors, he could not expect to know the truth unless he sought it out for himself. He was not yet twenty, but he meant to rule, and in order to rule wisely, he must understand the condition of the people. In spite of his outward devotion to sport and hunting, it is clear that he was thinking deeply and paid far more attention to state affairs than he let his courtiers know. Mahamanoga still regarded herself as virtual prime minister. But in 1561 she and her party received a severe check. Shams ad -Din Khan arrived from Kabul and was given control of political, financial, and military affairs. Maham was superseded. At the same time her brutal son, Adam Khan, was recalled from the government of Malwa. 
Apparently Akbar wished to reform him and to have him under his eye. But he had not been long in Agra when he surpassed, in a supreme outrage, all his former audacities. On a day in May 1561 Akbar was asleep in his harem, adjoining the hall where the new Prime Minister, Shamsuddin, was engaged in public business with other officials. To them strode in Adam Khan with a gang behind him, heedless of their courtesies, he advanced with loud and insolent threats. Then he signed to two of his followers, they set upon Shamsuddin with their swords, he ran out, was again struck and fell dead. The noise roused Akbar. Already Adam Khan was at Akbar's door, bent on a great murder, but the door was bolted and guarded. Akbar had been told of what had happened, and went out by another way. He saw the blood-stained corpse. The two met on the terrace. Adam Khan tried to seize the Emperor's sword, but Akbar felled him with his fist. The, terrible in his rage, he ordered his men to bind and take up the senseless miscreant and throw him from the terrace. But the men were timid, and fear made them half-hearted in the business. Adam Khan was found below, still breathing. He was carried up and again flung headlong, his neck was broken and his brains scattered. Akbar retired to his harem. Mahamanaga, hearing that her son had committed an outrage and had been imprisoned, rose terrified from a sick bed and came in supplication to the emperor. Akbar spoke briefly, Adam Khan killed our minister, we have punished him. The wretched woman still did not know that her son was dead. She could only murmur, you did well. A little after, she learned the truth. How was he killed? She asked. We don't know. They answered but there is the mark of a mace on his face. The mace was Akbar's fist. Maham did not dare to complain openly, but inwardly she was wounded by a thousand deadly blows. She shut herself up and wept, her illness grew worse, and in six weeks she was dead. Akbar was free at last to govern in reality. Chapter 7 Thus it was that Akbar emerged from behind the veil, in annual facts or less phrase, and now openly and in person undertook the supervision of his government. The corruption and embezzlement which had flourished under Mahamanaga and her faction were stopped, though the chiefs who had shared in her intrigues and connived at the treachery of her son were treated with singular generosity. It was now that the old practice of Muslim invaders of enslaving Indian prisoners of war was abolished by edict. Already, earlier in the year 1562, Akbar had married a Rajput princess of Jaipur, who was to become the mother of his successor Yuanji. Such a marriage was a symbol of his irrevocable union with India and her destinies. He was no more the foreign invader, but India's adopted son. The subtle influences of this Hindu marriage were fruitful of consequences. About this time, too, the most famous of Indian singers and musicians, Tansan of Gwalia, was summoned to court. He was received with great honor and with lavish gifts. Akbar loved music, and studied it to some purpose, Tansum became a special favorite. Another Hindu singer and musician, Bible, was to become one of Akbar's intimates and dearest friends, and he loved to listen to his jokes and stories. Yet Akbar's inner nature had undergone a shock. He had always been devoted to his nurse, Mahamanaga. He had overlooked the faults of her worthless son, and given him far more chances than he deserved, yet this man had treacherously tried to murder him, and who could tell how far his own mother was innocent? He had trusted one man after another who had betrayed his trust. He realized that he must rely on himself alone, but what a vast burden he was called upon to shoulder. Where was the truth? How would God reveal it to him? He mixed in disguise with the commonest of his subjects. He broke off from hunting to consort with any dust-stained hermit or fakir, who might prove a physician of the soul. He questioned the learned, and, though he forbore to deride them, he found their answers profitless and empty. Now on completing his twentieth year, in spite of all his achievements and his intense zest in life, experienced an internal bitterness. From the lack of spiritual provision for my last journey my soul was seized with exceeding sorrow. 
the mystical illumination which had come to the boy of fourteen, when he rolled away from men to be in utter solitude, had been an experience isolated from the rest of his ardent and manifold activities. Yet it showed what was in the depths of his nature. He had an unquenchable thirst for truth, for spiritual reality. Hypocrisy and pretension imposed on him not at all. He desired an anchor for his soul. He desired to know the divine will, and to act in accordance with it. But how was the divine will to be known? This was Akbar's restless search for all the days that he lived. What wonder if, bearing alone the burden of an empire and answerable for the welfare of millions, he experienced fits of deep dejection? Even his reckless feats of daring which filled his courtiers with consternation as when, mounted on the fiercest and wittiest of elephants, he made him fight with another elephant till his own victoriously chased the other across the Jumna half submerging the bridge of boats in their wild rush even these, if we may believe his own explanation, were inspired not merely by physical exaltation in his own strength and skill, but by a deeper prompting. Was it the divine will that he should die? Had he offended God and gone contrary to his commands? Then it were better not to go on living. He would put it to the proof. For if God intended he should die, by taking such fearful odds he offered himself for death. But if by a one day he should be preserved it was a sign that he should live. These spiritual wrestlings with himself were hidden from the world. Men saw that their young king was indeed a man. More than his extraordinary physical prowess, his bold resolution and swift action impressed all those around him, and far and wide his manifest determination to treat Hindu and Muslim with equal justice won him loyal adherents where he might have had obstinate enemies. Further measures of wise generosity still more conciliated the Hindus. In 1563 Akbar was in camp at Mathara, hunting tigers. Mathara is a holy place, the resort of pilgrims. And now he learned that the government had made a practice of levying attacks on all pilgrims to the holy places of India, bringing in a revenue of some millions of rupees. He was indignant. The Hindus might be wrong in their modes of worship, but the pilgrims assembled to worship God. It was surely not God's pleasure that they should be taxed. Forthwith the tax was remitted throughout the empire. Exhilarated by this merciful act, the young emperor started to walk the thirty-six miles from Mathara to Agra in a day. Of all his followers, only an exhausted three arrived with him at Agra. He outstripped his court in body, how much more in mind. Early in the next year, still in the same mood of generous impulse, he resolved to remit the poll tax levied on all adult males who were not M.